All right, this is the uh, Plant Kingdom, page uh, L1. And uh, there's uh, 350,000 species of plants. And I think we'll only hold you responsible for 175,000 of them. Uh, now, again, what I'm trying to impress upon you is when we go and ask you to learn like three or four or five examples of an entire kingdom, that's just a few examples where there are thousands and thousands of species. Uh, and so we're just trying to give you a little bit of a sense of the diversity of life on this planet. Um, here I've defined uh, the characteristics. Uh, let me write it this way. Uh, all right, so I kind of wrote something here. Just as a way of simplifying. So uh, this is kind of the whole layout for the plant kingdom that I'll be expanding upon. Again, every, any time I write something on a blank sheet of paper, the same information is in the lab manual. It's usually the same information that's underlined. Uh, and uh, how would we define, in general, the members of the plant kingdom? In general, they are multicellular. They're not just one cell. Uh, they have a nucleus, eukaryotic, and they're autotrophs. They, what does that mean? They make their own food. They carry on photosynthesis. They don't eat other things. Uh, and uh, we're going to divide the plant kingdom, which is, again, over 350,000 species, we're going to divide them into a few groupings here. First, I've described the so-called aquatic algae. What does that mean? A word aquatic means they live in the water. Aqua means water. Agua is water. All right, so they live in the water. And when we have plant-like organisms that live in the water, they, we commonly use the word algae. There are really a number of phylum or groupings here. Aquatic algae is not a, a scientific category. It's just me describing these two phylum. And uh, we're going to uh, just uh, identify two of, uh, of several uh, phylum of aquatic algae. We're going to talk about phylum green algae and phylum brown algae. The fancy names are chlorophyta and theophyta. I'm not asking you to know those. Uh, the, I'm trying to avoid using big, highfalutin, fancy, complicated scientific words. But we have to call them something. So uh, when I can give you a, uh, a name that's simpler than the scientific name, I try to do that. Sometimes I don't have any choice because we don't have any simpler name for these organisms. So uh, we're going to talk about a few examples of green algae and brown algae. And they're called that because they either look green or brown. We'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, then there are the so-called terrestrial uh, plants. Uh, the word terrestrial means they live on land. <laughs> if we're talking about an extraterrestrial, they live on, live on another planet. Uh, the uh, terrestrial means on land. And these uh, include, uh, uh, and, uh, these include mosses and the tracheophytes. Now the technical scientific name for mosses is bryophyta, but we'll just call them phylum mosses. If you want to learn the fancy name, you can. Uh, and we're going to learn what mosses are. One thing we know, today we learned what lichens are. And while many of you thought a lichen was a moss, we're going to explain what a moss is and understand that that's not the same as a lichen. They're different. Uh, and, but the most important, the most important of all the phylum in the plant kingdom is phylum tracheophyta. Tracheo means a tube. And in fact, we have a tube. The scientific name for your windpipe is the trachea. It just means tube. These guys don't have a windpipe, but what they do is they have tubes or vessels. And so we commonly call them vascular plants. They have vessels or tubes. And these vessels or tubes act like a little circulatory system in plants, just like we have a circulatory system. Obviously, they don't have blood. And uh, we're going to talk about these tracheophytes. They have two types of vessels or tubes. They have phloem down and xylem up. And if you're wondering what does that mean, that means that uh, when we look at uh, any uh, plant, and I'll uh, grab a plant here.
So when we have a plant, there are vessels uh, in the, in the uh, parts of the plant, like in the leaves and so on, in the stems, and some of the vessels carry water and minerals up through the xylem up vessels, and, but the sugars that are made by photosynthesis in the leaves are carried down by the flow them down vessels. So we have flow them down and xylem up. And obviously, I kind of describe it as flow them down, because if you can remember flow them flows down, flow them down, then obviously the other one must be up, just as a way of remembering it. So uh, we'll have more to say about that in a moment. And then uh, we're, but there, we're going to divide the, the, uh, this very important uh, phylum of that so-called vascular plants. And I do want you to know the word tracheophyta. We're going to divide them into three classes. Uh, class ferns. Again, the, technically the scientific name for fern is phyllocineae, but we'll just say ferns. And uh, secondly, class gymnosperm, or conifers. Those are like the needle. The, the, the plants and trees that have needles, like pine trees. And uh, we'll talk about those. And anything I'm skipping as I'm showing you this, we'll get to. And we'll come back to it again. Uh, and then, uh, lastly, and most importantly, class angiosperm. And the word angio that is a Greek root that means flower. And these are the flowering plants and trees. And they're the most important of all the members of the plant kingdom. And they're so important, and there's so many of them, that we're going to further subdivide them into subclasses. And uh, two subclasses, subclass monocot and subclass dicot. So this is this huge kingdom, the plant kingdom, just to have a better sense. Now, I know, I know that right now you're trying to hurriedly write this down. We'll show it to you again later. In fact, this entire diagram is shown much nicer, instead of me drawing it, it's actually printed right in your lab manual. You'll see it. We'll get to it. Okay, let's go through this uh, more, a little bit more systematically. So uh, at the top, we mentioned the characteristics of the members of the plant kingdom. Obviously, they have chlorophyll to carry on photosynthesis. It's always good, especially to focus your attention on the words that are underlined. Uh, they also have an outer cell wall containing uh, the polysaccharide cellulose. All right, now we said we were going to divide uh, the plant kingdom into these simpler aquatic algae that live in the water and the terrestrial or land plants and trees. So of the aquatic algae, we're going to talk about two phylum, uh, phylum green algae and phylum brown algae. And of the green algae, uh, we're going to give you two examples, volvox, and spirogyra. Now, some of you may have noticed I had a microscope at the back of the classroom. It'll be out again next time, and you can see the videos of it. Did anybody notice this organism that kind of looked like these balls with uh, things? That's called volvox. This is a green algae. It lives in the water. And uh, this really, is, this big ball is a colony of microscopic cells. And each of these smaller balls inside the big ball are baby colonies. And literally, when it, in a sense, quote, gives birth, these baby colonies break out of the mother colony. I know, it, it, all this sounds like science fiction, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, where they get the ideas for all these science fiction aliens is from real things that live on our planet, because there's a lot of weird stuff. Uh, the, uh, what each of these colonies is made of, you'll see these little tiny speck, green speckles. Each of these little green speckles is one of these cells. So this is what each of these plant cells looks like. Notice it has flagella. They move. And they, uh, they actually are a whole, thousands of them grouped together in a colony. And that's a baby colony. Here's a baby colony. And in, they're inside a mother colony. Now, why this volvox organism is considered very interesting to evolutionary biologists is, uh, and you can see I describe this organism as a ball of hundreds of small flagellated algal cells that are bound together in a kind of gelatinous matrix. Why this is especially interesting to evolutionary biologists 
is they kind of think that maybe this is some sort of intermediate step on the way between single-celled organisms and true multicellular organisms. Because these are like colonies of cells. And uh, if you're thinking, did you write that? Yeah, I wrote that on page L2. Volvox is an organism that maybe represents an intermediate stage of evolutionary development between unicellular and true multicellular organisms. All right, that's one example of a green algae. It's a plant that lives in the water, uh, and it's green. Uh, on the next page, L3, a second example is Spirogyra. Did anybody notice there's a microscope in the back, and it's got like these cells, and they've got this spiral shape thing. That uh, spiral shape thing is the chloroplast. It's got a spiral shaped chloroplast. You'd say, did you write that? Yeah. Um, right there. In fact, uh, it's kind of a cute name, Spirogyra. I'm not even asking you to know the name Spirogyra. I just want you to know this, when you see it, it what kingdom it is. It's a plant kingdom. And uh, it's a green algae, phylum green algae. That's what I want you to know. Uh, you don't have to know the name of the organism, Spirogyra. Uh, interestingly, uh, a number of years ago, this is already quite a few years ago, there was a jazz rock fusion group called Spirogyra. If anybody had ever heard of that. And, uh, and apparently the band members gave themselves the name Spirogyra. They were probably bored out of their mind in a high school biology class. But uh, when they heard the name of this organism, they chose that as the name of their group. I don't know if anybody ever heard of Spirogyra. But anyhow, uh, uh, on page uh, L4, on L4, uh, at the bottom of L4, brown algae. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, try to put out better examples of brown algae than we had today uh, we'll, uh, for next time we meet. You know brown algae better by the name kelp. So all of you have seen kelp, brown kelp, swept up onto Venice Beach or Santa Monica Beach, right? Has anybody ever seen that big brown kelp? Yeah. OK, and there's, these are that, they're real, actually in phylum brown algae. And they do look brown. Now, they do contain green chlorophyll, but they also contain a brown pigment. And so you kind of notice the brown color more than any green coloration to them. Uh, the, there are many types. There's a, a more than 1,000 species of kelp or brown algae. But the one that we're most familiar with is called the giant bladder kelp. I'm not asking you to know its name. Uh, it can be up to 100 feet long. And there's a picture of it on the next page. And this is what you've seen swept up onto the sand, because this lives right off the coast of California. And um, so what you notice, these are these brown, and what you would call leaves are technically called blades. And it's written there. These are called blades. And, and you might say, well, why do they call them blades? Why don't they call them leaves? They look like leaves. We only use the word leaf when we're talking about plants that have vessels in them. And there are no vessels. There's no tubes. There's no, quote, veins in these uh, so-called leaves. They are blades. So when we look at uh, a rose, the leaf of a rose has little veins or vessels. We call it a leaf. But here we don't have those vessels. This is not a vascular plant. Uh, similarly, what you might call a stem is called a stipe for the same reason. Real stems have vessels in them. And this does not have any vessels. This is not a vascular plant. It's an algae. Uh, the, uh, it has a thing down here labeled a hold fast. You probably would have called that a root, but it's not a root. The main reason why it's not a root is it doesn't have any vessels uh, or tubes. It's, uh, this is not a, a, va a vascular plant. But furthermore, it doesn't have the same function as a root. The function of roots in plant, higher plants is to absorb water and minerals from the soil. This guy doesn't need to absorb water and minerals. He lives, this, this uh, kelp lives in the water. It lives in the ocean water. It's surrounded by water and minerals. It doesn't have to absorb water from the, the, the uh, bottom of the ocean. The purpose of this root-like structure is to anchor it to the ground so that the ocean currents don't carry it off to Ecuador. 
All right, so it acts as a hold fast. It holds it fast to the bottom of the ocean so it's not carried away. It's like an anchor. So it has nothing to do with absorbing water like real roots do. Uh, and then the last thing, of course, that is most famous about this giant bladder kelp that you see swept up onto the sand, what, what do you do when you see one of those kelps? You know what most people do? They go onto it and pop those air bladders. Anybody ever do that? No. No, anybody know what I'm talking about? They always have these little floats, and people like to pop them. No? As, who's done that? All right? Because it makes a popping sound. It's fun. All right? Now, these are, these little, uh, uh, these are called air bladders or bladders. Now, here's the question. If they, they normally hold air. So, you know, you can see them. What's the purpose of them? Let me give you the purpose. Have you ever tried to pit, lift up one of the kelps? Are they light? No. They're really heavy. This is a plant. It has to float on the ocean to carry on photosynthesis. But it's really heavy, and it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. The purpose of these air bladders is they act as floats. And that's what causes it to float on the surface. And uh, while you usually see them swept up onto the sand, if you ever take a drive up Highway 1, all along the Monterey, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the along, uh, around Monterey and Carmel and so on, you'll see these large kelps out in the ocean in the beautiful waters off uh, Central California. Huh? So this is different than seaweed then, right? This is not seaweed. Yeah, I used to call it seaweed. Though. Seaweed is green Wheat. This is a big kelp, okay. or, or better, the best term is a brown algae, and it actually looks brown. Uh, all right, so now you know a little bit about it. And everything I've just described about the uh, air bladders and the blades and the stipes and, and the holdfast are described here. I am not even going to cover red algae. I know you're going, darn. And that takes us to L6. I'll just go a couple last minutes here for today. On L6, so we've talked about the two types of aquatic algae, green algae and brown algae, and there's examples of that, and you'll, we'll have them out again next time. So let me just begin the higher plants. Uh, the higher plants are plants that live on land. Uh, and in order for plants to live on land, this creates a lot of problems. First, they have to have a way of absorbing water from the soil. If you live in the water, you don't have to have a way of absorbing water. You're just surrounded by water. So uh, that's why these plants generally have to have a way of taking up water from the ground. First, uh, furthermore, they have to be able to survive ch major changes in temperature. Uh, living in the ocean, the temperature of the ocean water or a lake doesn't change that much between day and night and summer or winter. But living on land, the difference in temperature between day and night and summer and winter can be 100 degrees. It could be freezing at a nighttime in the winter night, and it could be 100 degrees during the daytime uh, in the summer. So they have to be able to tolerate big changes in temperature to live on land. And they also have to be adapted to reproduce on land. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, we're going to talk about two phylum of land plants. The uh, less important one are phylum mosses, or bryophyta. And these are, we'll have, we had them out last time, we'll have them out again. They're just really tiny plants. Where do you usually find moss growing? You usually find moss growing right near where the, the foundation of your house or apartment building is, where it's kind of muddy all the time. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And you'll see this fine little green plant, really just a little tiny green plant growing where it's all muddy. It's barely adapted to live on land. It's an extremely small plant. We've got a, it's some in a, 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 a little container in the back. It's a little fuzzy green plant, and it barely is adapted to live on land. It can only live where it's muddy all the time. The more important phylum, this is where I'll stop for today, the more important phylum is phylum tracheophyta. I do want you to know that name because that's the most important phylum in the plant kingdom. These are the plants that have tubes or vessels, the vascular plants. And they have phloem and xylem. So the last thing I'll say for today uh, is on page L9, 
on L9 at the top. So I mentioned on the top of L9 the two types of vessels, flow them down, there it is, flow them down or flow them, and xylem or xylem up. And so the flow them carries uh, sugars uh, from the leaves of the plant down, commonly down to the roots. You might say, what do you mean? When you eat a carrot, the carrot is the root of a, a plant. Does it taste kind of sweet? Sometimes, because there's sugar in it. How did the sugar that was made in the leaves of the carrot plant get down into the root? It was carried by the flow and down. A beets, if you've ever heard of sugar beets or beets, why are they sweet? Because sugar was carried from the leaves of the beet plant down into the roots. Uh, so that's the uh, flow and down, and the xylem up carries water and minerals upwards from the roots up to the leaves. Next time, we'll go through those classes. We'll talk about ferns, talk about conifers, and flowering plants and trees, and learn about flowers.